So with that, it is my absolute pleasure, pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Severin Borenstein is a professor at the UC Berkeley Graduate School at, uh, in the Economic Analysis and Policy Group at the Haas School of Business. And he's the faculty, um, the faculty director of the Energy Institute at Haas. And I'm not gonna give any more of his bio because we've asked him to tell you guys a bit about his, his career pathway. So you'll be hearing about it that way. So uh, with that, Severin, I'm handing over the virtual mic to you. Thanks a lot. And thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, so yeah, I was asked to start by giving a little background on myself and how I got to where I am today. Um, uh, I am a professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, I actually grew up in Berkeley and went to Berkeley High School uh, and uh, managed to move all over the country and then work my way back across the country to Berkeley again. Um, I went to undergrad for two years at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and then came back and finished at Berkeley. Uh, I worked at the Civil Aeronautics Board uh, during airline deregulation. Prior to 1978, uh, the US airline industry was a completely regulated industry. Prices were set through the Civil Aeronautics Board. And in 78, um, it was airlines were deregulated and uh, it was a really exciting time to work there. Uh, it's the only time I've ever worked in DC and everyone has told me that I should never go back because it was a, a really unusual case. The um, chair of the Civil Aeronautics Board was an economist, a very famous economist, Alfred Kahn, who is actually in some ways more famous for his electricity regulation work than for his airline regulation work. Um, but I became friends with him and with a number of other people at the CAB. And uh, that really cemented my interest in doing economic regulation. Uh, I went to graduate school at MIT. And well, in graduate school, I did a number of, worked in a number of areas, but I ended up writing a dissertation about price discrimination and with an application to the airline industry. And when I went off to become an assistant professor at University of Michigan, which I did in the 80s, um, I uh, did most of my research on airlines for a while, uh, it, which is a fascinating industry. But I got interested in price discrimination in other areas, and I was having a conversation one day at, the, at a gas station in Ann Arbor with the owner of the station about how he prices leaded and unleaded gasoline. So um, this is how I come up with most of my research ideas. It is not from reading academic papers. It is from reading the popular press and from talking to business people and regulators. Um, and so he, we talked about why <clears throat> he was the only station in Ann Arbor selling leaded and unleaded gasoline for the same price and why the markup among most stations was higher for unleaded. Uh, the short answer, which I ended up writing a paper about five years later, is that um, unleaded gasoline was bought by wealthier customers because they were the ones who owned the new cars and they were more willing, they were less willing to shop around than the poorer people who owned the old cars. And so the margin tended to be higher on unleaded gasoline because you could get away with it. People wouldn't switch as much. Uh, from there, I started working on the oil industry a lot and gasoline. And in 1994, I was, May, I was appointed director of the UC Energy Institute. I was still, at that point, I was a professor at UC Davis in the econ department, which I went to in 1989. And so for a couple of years, I actually had a split appointment between Berkeley and Davis uh, and was doing some work still on oil and gasoline. But that was when California started to pursue deregulation of its electricity market. And so I, I had been teaching regulation courses, so I knew some about uh, electricity markets, but uh, I had to learn a lot fast, particularly since about two months after I was appointed director of the Energy Institute, um, I was told, I was asked, invited to come to Sacramento to testify before the state legislature on electricity restructuring. Uh, and 
from there, I ended up doing a lot of work on how electricity markets work, much of it with Jim Bushnell, who is in the economics department there at UC Davis. Jim used to be at the Energy Institute at Berkeley, and he and I have written many, many papers together. Um, and uh, one of our primary focuses at that point was on the potential for sellers to exercise market power in wholesale electricity markets. Uh, and we did some calculations and some modeling of the electricity market. And we're pretty surprised to find that it looked like sellers could really jack up prices in a wholesale electricity market because demand is pretty inelastic. And when you hit capacity constraints on the supply side, the supply is pretty inelastic. So when you get in that situation, if a seller sells a little bit less electricity, it can really drive prices up. Uh, we pointed this out and were largely dismissed by policymakers and industry people. Um, one executive at a, one of the leading, one of the big investor owned utilities said to me in 1998, that's ridiculous. That's never happened before. And I remember thinking, boy, if you think the experience under regulation is a good indicator of how things are gonna work under deregulation, I think you're gonna be surprised. And he was. Uh, so when California had its electricity crisis in 2000, 2001, and prices skyrocketed, and uh, we later confirmed that some generators were shutting down production in order to drive up prices, um, uh, Jim and I got a lot more exposure at that point, and um, people became much more interested in our work. Uh, I've continued to work on electricity markets uh, at the wholesale level. After the cri electricity crisis, when California bought a whole lot of generation, built a lot of new generation, wholesale prices went back down, and the focus turned to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I started working on the environmental side more. Uh, have written a lot on along the way on retail electricity pricing, which I'm going to talk about today primarily. And Jim and I, along with Frank Wolak, were then hired by the California Air Resources Board in 2011 uh, because they were about to open the California cap and trade market. Uh, and they were aware of the work we had done on electricity markets, and they, in their words, wanted us to stress test the cap and trade market, figure out what could go wrong. And we did, and we pointed out a few things, and they made a couple of adjustments. Uh, that market has been pretty quiet, uh, although prices have gone up a bit in the last couple of months. Um, and I have turned more towards working on retail rate design in electricity and how retail rates are set. And over the last decade or a little more than a decade, I've started working a lot more on uh, distributional consequences uh, and equity issues. Uh, so I wrote a paper in 2010, looking at uh, electricity rates in California that were supposed to be helping low income customers and asking whether they really do. Um, and been doing that sort of work since. Uh, I will, and that's of course become much more of a focus in the last few years. And the paper I'm going to present today is follows on that by looking at the distributional consequences of California's rates and why we are, why rates are so high and how we are, um, uh, uh, loading a lot of costs into those rates and the impact of that. Before I get to that, though, I'm going to mention one other thing I have been doing again with Jim Bush now, but also with Ryan Kellogg at University of Chicago and Steve Sakela at Tufts. Um, the four of us have gotten very involved in policy discussions in DC around the clean electricity uh, payment program, the known as the SAP, which now will is I it's pretty clearly not going to be part of the reconciliation bill. But when we got involved in it, uh, it looked like it was going to be. Uh, 
And it started with a discussion, and Jim wrote an early blog on this about you know how it was being designed. Although all at that point, all we had was sketchy press reports because the designers had not actually released the information. And then in late September, they did. And it was just as bad as we feared. Uh, and we did basically what we had done in 1998 for electricity markets and in 2011 for the cap and trade market. We said, OK, if we're a player in this market, how would we respond to the incentives that this program sets up? And it was um, pretty disturbing. Uh, the SEP had been written by people who really didn't appreciate the impact of incentives uh, and how firms actually behave and how they would go about trying to make money in response to these regulations. Uh, and there were some just really straightforward ways of gaming that program that would have cost billions of dollars. Um, in the end, I actually became convinced that the SEP would do more harm than good. And I'm hoping that money will get repurposed towards more effective greenhouse gas reduction policies. Uh, and uh, I think it was another, uh, another uh, recognition that when you do policy, that regula regulatory policy, you really need to think about how the other actors in the market are going to respond to that policy, not as the people who wrote this did, just assume they will keep doing what they're doing or will do what they're told um, in, or what we hope they would do in response to this regulation. Uh, so uh, that was a sort of brutal reminder that uh, things are, um, that policy continues to get made in ways that ignore these potential downsides that led to the California electricity crisis. And by the way, are now, I just half an hour ago, I got off the phone with the UK Treasury, people from the UK Treasury Department, because the UK is going through an electricity crisis right now uh, that's triggered somewhat differently, probably not about market power, but about the very high natural gas prices in the UK that are driving up electricity rates there. And at the same time, they have retail price caps. Uh, so we have a bunch of retailers who are now going bankrupt in the UK. Um, and they are trying to have a policy discussion of how do we change this uh, in a way that doesn't allow retail rates to skyrocket, but at the same time doesn't leave us with a uh, completely dysfunctional electricity market. So I'll stop there. Um, if anybody has questions about any of those things, well, I guess we don't want to get off onto other policies quite yet. Um, I'm happy to talk about those things during the Q&A. But what I have been asked to talk about today is this work that um, I have been work doing with Meredith Fowley and a different Jim, Jim Salee, uh, both of whom are also at Berkeley. Uh, and. Uh, our affiliates of the Energy Institute at Haas. Uh, and this is about designing rates um, that both allow, uh, the, uh, are, are consistent with the goals of our energy transition and uh, promote equity. And I will uh, argue that although we are trying to do that, the way we're doing it right now is actually failing on both of these um, goals. And I'm not sure what the protocol is, but if you do have clarifying questions, at least along the way, please feel free to, I guess, unmute yourself and speak up. We didn't talk about that. Uh, sure, that, that's okay. Or just raise your hand and then, yeah, and then yeah. we can. Uh, don't try to chat to me because I won't see it. I, I hate the chat function um, during seminars. Uh, so, um, but if you raise your hand, um, Alyssa or I can call on you, or you can just unmute yourself and start talking. So this is the starting point of the work. Um, these are box and whiskers plots of electricity rates around the United States, uh, and with uh, dots representing the three big utilities in California, or the three big investor-owned utilities. Uh, the blue box, the white line in the middle is the median, 
the top and bottom of the box is 25th and 75th percentile, and the top and bottom of the whiskers is the 5th and 95th percentile. And what you see is right after the electricity crisis in California, California utilities had very high rates, paying off the cost of that crisis. Around the middle of the, uh, or the end of that decade, we were starting to get somewhat closer to in line with the rest of the country. And more recently, we are once again getting very out of line with the rest of the country, particularly San Diego. And I'll come back to talk about that. Uh, of the three utilities, PG&E, our local utility is the uh, middle case, and I'm going to focus primarily on PG&E, recognizing that Southern California Edison's rates are somewhat lower and San Diego's are somewhat higher. But the story that comes out when you look at these is pretty much the same for all three of them. Just to remind you what, where these utilities are, PG&E has this immense sprawling uh, uh, service territory uh, that goes almost to the northern border. The Pacific Core um, does serve the very top of California, but hardly anyone lives in that area, so they actually have very few customers. And then, of course, um, S Southern California Edison covers also a huge area, and San Diego Gas and Electric, although it covers a much smaller area, um, still serves over a million customers. Uh, pg e and Edison both serve about 5 million customers. And then there are carve outs that you can see here, the, the one you're no doubt familiar with, SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and then Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, who are the two biggest um, uh, municipal utilities in the state. We're going to focus on PG&E, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric in uh, this discussion. So what do we do? First, we ask why California's rates are so high um, and, and particularly the volumetric rate, the rate per kilowatt hour. Um, and what we're gonna find is that there are a lot of costs in our rates that are not actually costs that vary through with supply, but are still recovered through volumetric rates. So there are a lot of fixed costs being recovered through marginal prices. Uh, and that as a result, when we do a calculation of the marginal cost, including externalities, and that is so the social marginal cost, including externalities, uh, that number turns out to be about a third of the actual price customers pay for San Diego and PG&E and over half for um, Southern California Edison. Who's paying these costs? What we're going to show is that this is actually being increasingly uh, uh, paid by low income households or lower income households, um, despite the fact that we do have a program for low income households that cuts their rates somewhat. And despite the fact um, that there are plenty of rich households that are uh, on the system. And then the third part of this is much more prescriptive. Um, how might we change that? How might we recover these costs in a more efficient and equitable way? And we propose a couple of alternatives that I will talk about. So just to remind you, um, ideally in economics, uh, the efficient price is a price that reflects social marginal cost. In electricity, as you probably know, that varies hour to hour and even minute to minute. Um, so we would want time bearing social marginal cost to be the price for electricity. Uh, the social includes uh, the pollution externalities. The marginal means that we, uh, the price should reflect the true incremental cost that you impose when you, when you uh, uh, consume a little bit more electricity. Uh, and that if you try to recover fixed costs that are fixed that don't change with your consumption uh, through an electricity price on extra units, then you're going to misalign prices with uh, the actual cost people are imposing on the system. So the social marginal cost, as I said, captures all the incremental costs. Um, <coughs> 
And the idea is that if price equals social marginal cost, consumers deciding to use more electricity uh, can trade off. Do I value this more than the cost I'm imposing on society? Um, and you know, it's a sidebar here. It's interesting that there's so many discussions these days of being a thoughtful shopper and um, thinking about the impact of what you buy and so forth. But most of us don't have the time or expertise to actually understand the impact of what we're buying. Uh, that is to do the research on the upstream supply chain and their um, environmental footprint and their uh, worker uh, treatment and so forth. Uh, and so in large part, the best way to signal that those things to consumers is through price. Uh, and that is the one thing we know consumers generally do pay attention to. Uh, and so uh, if, we set, if we send a price signal that reflects the social marginal cost, uh, that is a way in which consumers then have an incentive uh, to really compare their value of a good with the, uh, with the cost that, uh, of producing it. So we estimate this social marginal cost uh, for the three IOUs uh, and uh, then compare prices to them. This is for PG&E. This is our estimate of social marginal cost. Now, as I said, social marginal cost varies hour to hour and we're not gonna spend time on that today. Um, but what this is, is a weight, quantity weighted average. And it's got a bunch of things in it. So these bottom three bars, are the cost of the needed extra capacity as consumers consume more. Um, now, most of the hours of the year, you don't need extra capacity, there's plenty of capacity, but at peak hours you do. And so that's that extra capacity cost, but it's averaged over the entire uh, consumption. And then there's energy, the actual cost of supplying the electricity, that's uh, the fuel cost and some marginal operating costs of the plant. Uh, ancillary services, for those of you who are geeks about that, is the additional cost of actually balancing the system. And then there are the cost of the greenhouse gases and pollution externalities. Um, what you'll notice is this, uh, I don't know what color that is, light blue. Um, in the early years of our sample, is it's all light blue. In the later years, there's a dark blue component. So in the early years, all of this is unpriced greenhouse gas emissions. In the later years, some of it gets priced, and 2013 is the year the, the California cap and trade market started. And so in these later years, this dark blue is the component of the greenhouse gases that is priced. Finally, um, when you ship electricity from generation to, to customer, some of it is lost along the way. And that essentially means all the other components have to be uh, 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 scaled up to compensate for that. And that's, those are the line losses. And so that's the last component. You'll note that up until 2019, we had a pretty clearly declining social marginal cost of electricity. Um, we got into a situation by the later part of that decade that uh, we had a lot of extra capacity. Uh, gas prices were relatively low. Uh, by the way, both of those have turned around in the last couple of years. And they, I think when we do a follow-up and we look at this again, we'll find that 2021 is up significantly from 2019. So note the scale here. So this goes up to about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. For the most recent years, it's around 8 cents a kilowatt hour. Whoops. Ah. This is take the, the red line is the top of those bars from the last slide. It's the social marginal cost calculation. The green the yellow line is the average retail rate for consumers who are not on the low income program. So among customers who are not on the low income program, what we see here is that right now, um, the, or in, by 2019, 
the average retail rate was about three times, a little more than three times higher than social marginal cost. What's also interesting is we do have this low income program called CARE, California Alternative Rates for Energy. Um, and the CARE program is by law in elect for electricity, a 30 to 35% discount. And yes, low, these low income customers get a discount, but even with the discount, their price is about double social marginal cost. So the care program, people, when we have presented said, well, okay, yeah, you're saying that it's expensive and that could hurt the poor, but we have a program for the poor. Well, it turns out our program for the poor still leaves them with very high prices. For comparison, by the way, in 2019, the average electricity price in among all other Western states, um, which are part of our grid, uh, the average retail price was about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So the California prices are about twice as high on average as the rest of the West. These are the same graphs for Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric. You'll notice that Southern California Edison uh, has lower prices, but still um, about more than twice as high as social marginal costs. And even their care customers uh, are about 50% higher than social marginal cost. San Diego, which we'll come back to and talk about a bit more, has extremely high prices. This is um, a result in part of the fact that their wildfire uh, work started earlier. They had a very bad fire in 2007 and started doing a lot more grid hardening and vegetation management and so forth that, that has been loaded into their rates. Uh, they also have a bigger problem with a cost shift from rooftop solar, an issue I will talk about some more, uh, where uh, customers are able to avoid paying these very high rates by installing solar. Uh, and when they do, that means the fixed costs have to be spread over a smaller number of customers. And that's had a very significant impact on San Diego, much more so than on PG&E and much, much more so than on Edison. Um, even care customers in San Diego are paying about twice as much as uh, the social marginal cost. So why should this bother us? Well, first of all, there's the efficiency argument. And that is that what we're doing is we're raising price way above social marginal cost. And that's going to discourage people from consuming electricity, even when they value it more than the cost of supplying it. So remember, the arguments for conservation generally say, you know, you're hurting the environment. We have those environmental costs in there. Um, and when and even when we do that, prices are just massively higher. But that's taken on new urgency uh, because it used to be we thought of electricity demand as pretty separate from natural gas demand and gasoline demand. But now that's changing. We, part of um, reducing greenhouse gases is decarbonizing uh, consumer energy use. And a big part of that is electrification. So we are charging prices now that are way above the cost of supplying electricity. And when people are making choices between gas furnaces and electric uh, space heating and between gas hot water heating and electric hot water heating or between electric vehicles and gasoline vehicles, they are seeing electricity prices that are just massively higher than the actual cost of supplying that additional electricity. And that discourages electrification. Uh, so that's one concern. The other concern is higher electricity prices uh, impose a large economic burden on low-income households. And we'll talk about uh, how, how, just how large in just a minute. Um, but you know, intuitively, everyone knows that low-income households spend more of their budget on energy, uh, whether it's gasoline or natural gas or electricity. And so when you start collecting uh, revenues through electricity prices, uh, they, that uh, that uh, it imposes a burden. Now, one thing we've done historically is in California is we've had a 
baseline amount of electricity that a household can buy for a lower price and then a higher price beyond that, what's known as increasing block pricing. Uh, and the idea was that would help low income customers. The work I did a decade ago showed it didn't help customers much, even back in 2006, the data I used for that paper. Um, but now what we are finding is it barely helps at all uh, because it turns out low income customers um, these days, and this is an ongoing work that I don't have here to show you today, but low income customers these days um, consume almost as much per household as wealthy customers do net from the grid. So wealthy customers are still consuming on average more electricity, but they're also, they have a much higher uh, rate of installing rooftop solar. So they're buying a, just slightly more electricity than poor households from the grid. So to figure out you know, what, what was going into why these rates are so high, we did what we created what is, what is called a waterfall graph. So this waterfall to mix metaphor has two staircases. The lower staircase just replicates the bar graph I showed you before. So up and up to here, the GHG pollution uh, column, we are seeing the lower staircase replicates the, the marginal cost. So we have energy costs and we have capacity costs of generation, transmission, distribution. Um, and these are really marginal costs along with the marginal pollution costs, some of which this is for 2019 some of which is paid for through cap and trade and some of which is not paid for. The upper staircase is costs that are not marginal but are being collected through marginal rates. So this right-hand stair of the staircase has all the public purpose programs and other policy initiatives, including uh, energy efficiency programs are loaded in here. So all of those uh, pay, uh, subsidizing light bulbs and subsidizing uh, 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 heat insulation, all that is, is loaded into the rate in that little yellow strip. A bigger piece of it is uh, the CARE program. Uh, when we have lower rates for uh, low income, that revenue is made up by charging more for all the other kilowatt hours. Now, most of the care program is actually not paid directly by residential customers. Most of it's actually paid for through commercial and industrial rates, uh, though, of course, those end up feeding back into prices we pay for goods and services. Um, but uh, the low in, but uh, some of it is done through residential, and that's this component. The behind the meter solar PV photovoltaics increases costs because essentially when you install solar and are buying less from the grid as a result, uh, the fixed costs have to be spread over fewer kilowatt hours and that's what the brown box is. And then there are just these fixed costs of distribution, transmission, and generation. Distribution are the lines that run down your street. Uh, the cost of them doesn't change much when uh, you consume more or less electricity, almost all of those costs are fixed. They still have to be paid and they are being paid for through volumetric rates. Oh, I should have said, most of the United States customers have fixed charges per month as well as a price per kilowatt hour. And that is not the case with California investor-owned utilities. PG&E and uh, San Diego have no fixed charge and Southern California Edison has a pathetically small, I think it is three cents a day. Um, so basically effectively no fixed charge. This distribution box increasingly also includes um, increased vegetation management uh, and grid and distribution line replacement and hardening to respond to uh, climate change. The transmission box, is the fixed cost of transmission also is being recovered through um, uh, 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 volumetric charge. Also now reflecting more grid hardening and vegetation management. Um, somewhere, oh, and the generation box is, so this box is basically the cost of energy down here 
is the wholesale price of electricity today. The total cost for energy that the utility reports is that is based on all the contracts they've signed and their purchase from the spot market. So the total cost, the blue box is the difference between the total cost and what they would pay if they were just paying today's price of electricity. Uh, and so this is the cost of the fact that they have purchased electricity at higher prices than what is now the wholesale price. Now that doesn't mean they screwed up. They, that may be perfectly rational hedging, but for 2019, spot prices for electricity were way below the prices the utilities had paid. And so there was a lot of extra costs. Some of this is high cost of early stage renewables that were bought, but some of it is just high cost of historical gas contracts, gas fire generation contracts that were signed back when gas was a lot more expensive. One other piece I have to say that is somewhere in these boxes, but is not broken out in a way that we could really understand from the data available is uh, wildfire damages. So we are paying, despite what you may hear, we are paying through our rates for wildfire damages. When the utility is found uh, negligent, then shareholders have to cover it. But most of the damages the utilities have had to cover from wildfires, they have not been found negligent for, and those are being passed through into our retail rates. So these boxes, somewhere in these boxes is also uh, wildfire liability to the extent that they were not found negligent. These are the same boxes for Southern California Edison in San Diego. Um, the main things I'll point out in differences is San Diego has a much bigger brown box of rooftop solar. They have by far the highest rooftop solar penetration. Uh, the uh, Southern California Edison has much less rooftop solar penetration. San Diego has the biggest distribution box and that is probably in large part because they have been the earliest to get on the uh, distribution line upgrade and vegetation management. Uh, and San Diego has the highest rates. So some people look at these, and if you are in this uh, rate design world, some people have said, well, okay, you got to recover this extra revenue, but why don't you use dynamic pricing um, that varies with time and that'll help? And the answer is no, it really won't. It is a different way to recover these truly marginal costs. That is, if you charge prices that vary hour to hour, instead of just having a flat price for the marginal costs, you would have a high price when the system is stressed and less a lower price uh, when the system is, uh, has slack. Uh, and you may be able to save on some of these capacity costs by reducing the stress on the system. But all of that is on the lower staircase. Dynamic pricing is a great idea. We should do it. Um, it's an important part of reliability and cost control, but it doesn't do anything about this upper staircase. The upper staircase is fixed costs. Um, and those are, and the way we have done this, we've been very careful to take out the capacity costs associated with that peak demand, these costs are really fixed. There are things like vegetation management has to be done no matter how much electricity you consume over those wires, um, things like that. So we love dynamic pricing, we're all for it, um, but uh, that's all in the incremental costs. It only addresses the lower staircase the costs of the upper staircase just aren't incremental. And wh whether you put them in an incremental dynamic price or an, inc uh, or an incremental flat price, um, you're still uh, distorting the price signal. This also has an important effect on, roof on uh, rooftop solar incentives and the installation of rooftop solar. So because there are these big fixed costs, when you install solar on your rooftop, um, you are buying fewer kilowatt hours from the grid. And when you do, some of the utility does save money, but the utility saves a lot less money than you save. So going back to here, 
when the utility saves marginal costs, it doesn't even save all of that because some of that is an externality, but the utility saves this when you consume one less kilowatt hour from the grid, you save this. Uh, and so your private savings are about three times higher than the savings to the utility. And the difference is just reallocated to other customers. Now, a response that you may have heard is, oh, the solar saves the utility a lot of money by uh, delaying upgrades on uh, distribution lines and so forth. And that's true. And there's been some serious analysis about that and some really not very good analysis. The serious analysis by people like Duncan Calloway, my colleague here at Berkeley, shows that that is a really small effect. Um, that it certainly isn't, it doesn't amount to more than one cent a kilowatt hour. And I've done some other calculations that suggest it's probably a lot less than one cent a kilowatt hour. Um, and uh, so it is true that there are some additional savings, but um, the, it's pretty small. Most of this still has to be paid. So when one household installs rooftop solar, other households end up paying more. How much more? Well, this is the annual increase in electricity costs, average increase for customers who are not solar customers. And this, and this is something that's I think important to note, is the annual increase for customers who are on the CARE program. Now remember, by law, the CARE program is a 30 to 35% discount. So the burden of spreading fixed costs to volumetric rates of people who are still consuming from the grid is 70, 65 to 70% as high on care customers as on non-care customers. Now for San Diego, uh, the, the burden is much higher because San Diego has a whole lot more rooftop solar. So the, the burden is being spread on fewer customers who are still buying all of their electricity from the grid. So who are those customers? Well, to get an idea of how that burden is allocated, the first thing we did, and what I'm gonna show you today, is we went to the Consumer Expenditure Survey of the US the, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, this has uh, about 3,000 uh, uh, California residents in it. And from that, they estimate expense, share of expenditures on different categories, one of which luckily is electricity. And what we find is if you look at, say, gasoline, the wealthiest quintile, the wealthiest 20% of households consume about three times as much as the poorest quintile on electricity. If you look at all goods, all goods and services or all goods and services subject to sales tax, in both cases, the wealthiest households consume about four times as much as the poorest household, spend is about four times as much. If you look at electricity, the wealthiest households, this is for 2019, or sorry, for 2017, 18, it's actually gotten even flatter since then, consume about uh, twice, or pay about twice as much. The reason they pay about twice as much is because of the low income program and the very small effect of increasing block pricing. They actually, in terms of kilowatt hours these days, consume just a few percent more than the poorer households. So, oh, and then finally, if you just look at income, this is not the income tax liability, this is just income. If we have a progressive tax, that line would be even steeper, but the wealthiest households have an income about 17 times higher than the poorest households. So what we've done basically is we have decided we're gonna collect all these costs uh, the fixed costs, the climate change adaptation and mitigation costs, other policy programs such as energy efficiency. We're going to collect those all through volumetric rates. And that is about the most regressive tax that one could impose in order to collect those revenues. More regressive than a tax on gasoline, more regressive than a sales tax, and way, way, way more regressive than an income tax. So this is an extremely regressive approach to covering the costs of both the fixed costs of a 
of a grid and the uh, increasingly large cost of climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as a lot of other public policy programs like early investment in uh, experimental new renewable technologies. So we're taxing electricity consumption to pay for these things, um, and we're doing it in a way that uh, wealthy that hurts wealthier it hurts poorer households far more than it hurts wealthier households because wealthier households really don't consume much more from the grid than poorer households do, um, and this is an extremely regressive tax on uh, low income. So what can we do about that? Well, one thing is we can simply take some of these costs off of the electricity sector and move them to the state budget. I have been touting this for more than a year now. Um, we have been in many meetings with policy leaders and with uh, utilities and with ratepayer advocates and low income advocates and, uh, uh, and environmental groups. And there is almost uniform support for this, almost. The exception is Sacramento. That is the Capitol building, legislators are really not excited about this. Because if you're a legislator, you like to push forward your policy priorities, but you don't like to have to pay for them. And so the easiest thing to do is mandate something. So whether it is mandating a renewables portfolio standard or an energy efficiency program or net metering for rooftop solar, um, all of these things are things that legislators, some legislators like, but all of them have real costs associated with them. And uh, they have moved those costs. They've told the regulator, the California Public Utilities Commission to pay for them through rates. And when you tell that them to do that, um, you're essentially saying uh, you're going to put them into the electricity prices and impose an additional tax on electricity. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, we started this work early in the pandemic, and it looked at that point like the state budget was going to be a disaster. Uh, it did not turn out to be a disaster. As you probably heard, we have a huge budget surplus. I'm still hopeful for this solution. Uh, some of the actors that I've mentioned, uh, the utilities and the uh, uh, public interest groups are pushing for moving at least some of these programs. I'll give you one example. We pay for the CARE program, the low income program for electricity by raising rates for everybody else. We have a program for food. It's called CalFresh. We do not pay for CalFresh by raising the price of food for everyone else. We do not pay for Medi-Cal, the medical program, by raising the price of healthcare for everyone else. We pay for those through the state budget. Uh, so I think there's a pretty strong argument that we should be paying for low income uh, programs through the state budget. There is another historical artifact associated with care that I think is worth noting. The, care pro the low income programs are paid for through the customers of the same utility. Um, that means PG&E's customers pay for PG&E low income. And that means Palo Alto Municipal Utilities customers pay for Palo Alto's low income. If you know Palo Alto, you know that is a very small group. Palo Alto is an extremely rich area. This, is, by the way, does not include East Palo Alto. And so, um, we get a really disproportionate allocation of those costs across areas to, by paying for it through utility rates. An alternative approach that I'll spend just a couple of minutes on is what we devised when we thought the state, the idea of putting it on the state budget would not be successful, which is an income-based fixed charge. So if you just impose a fixed monthly charge, that's actually even more regressive than, um, than the volumetric pricing we do, tax we do now, although it would have better efficiency properties in that it would allow us to lower the rate to social marginal cost. But there's another way to do it, which is to have a fixed charge, but to 
vary that fixed charge with household income. Now that is a tough thing to implement. We actually in the paper go into some real detail about how you would do it with various alternatives, whether you, the, the franchise tax board, the California tax authority would have to be involved because they're the ones who know the income of various households. The franchise tax board could actually do the collection. The, the FT, they could transfer the information to the utilities. Say Severin Bornstein is in category four. They, he should pay the category four fixed charge. Um, or you could do it uh, through a third party. And you could also do it locationally. People in this area are presumed to be of this income level. If you are lower income than that, you can apply for an exemption or a change. This is, an, this is a novel approach to this approach for, uh, or to financing electricity. It is not a novel approach overall. In fact, uh, it is how we run the, um, uh, the, the uh, discount for the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it is also how we run the earned income tax credit. Now, both of those are actually government programs, though they're different branches of government that have to talk to each other. In this case, you would actually need uh, the Franchise Tax Board to work with uh, for-profit investor-owned utilities. We designed a sort of straw version of this and said, well, how, what would it look like? The red line is, what if you just charged everybody a fixed charge? How bit high would it be? have to be to lower price to social marginal cost? The yellow line is, what if you had an income-based fixed charge and you made it as progressive as the sales tax is? So I think this is a good one to focus on. Um, even this is, would be a bit of a stretch. We sort of pinned it down by saying, let's say the lowest quintile of customers uh, would be would have no fixed charge and then design everything else to be as progressive as the sales tax. If you did that, the highest income customers would pay a fixed monthly fixed charge of $150 a month, which sounds like a lot of money, but the actual effect on rates on bills, sorry, is substantially smaller. Because remember, though we're that charging those rich households $150 a month, we're lowering their volumetric charge quite a bit. In fact, we're lowering their volumetric charge um, enough that their bill goes up by about $60 a month. It would increase their bill. I mean, there's no question we'd be reallocating the revenue, but we'd reall be reallocating away from low income to wealthy. This, by the way, is a little glitch that would be needed to be fixed because there are customers in this income category who are on care who actually could, if we, this comes, we assume with eliminating the care program, we'd have to make sure that they are made as well off. Um, one effect of this, which uh, is one reason it's not very popular in some quarters is it would really change read reduce the incentive to install rooftop solar because rooftop solar in California is so popular because you are avoiding a 26 cent a kilowatt hour or 29 cent a kilowatt hour charge. If all you can avoid is the eight cents per kilowatt hour that you are truly saving society, uh, then you have much less incentive to install solar. I think that's appropriate. I think right now what we're doing is we're over incentivizing and by doing it, we're tilting towards rooftop solar and away from larger scale, more efficient renewable installations. And then there's also a big difference in how rooftop solar integrates with the grid. Um, it's the dumbest possible solar. It, it's not on trackers. It doesn't tilt um, to follow the sun. Uh, it can't be curtailed and uh, it can't uh, integrate when with, uh, with fluctuations in the grid nearly as well. Some people have asked us, well, if we did this, wouldn't this cause grid defection? People actually, and this is not low, what's called low defection where people consume less. This is people just cutting the cord in order to not pay the fixed charge. And the answer is if you do the, the math, the answer is 
almost no one would cut the cord. Um, remember, the bill isn't going up by 150, it's going up by 60. Um, who are those customers? Well, the customers who really would pay more are either customers who consume very little, wealthy customers who consume very little because they live alone and are in small dwellings. And a lot of those are multifamily dwellings where cutting the cord just isn't really feasible or because they've installed rooftop solar and pay only for net consumption. Um, and if that's the case, um, they, they would be able to cut the cord. They'd be able to save uh, for a customer who consumes a third of the average household from the grid, they would save about $100 a month or $1,200 a year. And the question is, is that worth it? And my answer is, I, I, as somebody who is at the higher end of the income distribution, I wouldn't give up the reliability of the grid for $1,200 a year, particularly when even installing batteries that give you 27 kilowatt hours, uh, and 27 kilowatt hours is not enough if you have an electrified home in the winter to get through more than a day or two. Um, even that would cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So when you do the math, batteries would have to get massively, massively cheaper before I think wealthy people would start to give up the reliability of the grid in order to avoid this fixed charge. Okay, so let me wrap up. Uh, we have volumetric rates that are used to raise revenues for lots of things that are not marginal. Um, these are all important investments um, in infrastructure, wildfire mitigation, liability, uh, but uh, they are not marginal costs of consuming electricity. And what, what that means is that we've essentially adopted a highly regressive tax um, that also has negative implications for uh, electrification. We could change the way we do this, uh, put more onto the state budget, um, and or to uh, do it through an income-based fixed charge, and that would make electricity more affordable and make it easier to decarbonize. Um, and uh, these discussions are ongoing. There's a lot of momentum for trying to lower rates. Uh, and I think we are gonna get some progress probably for at least reducing new things coming on to the electricity bill. I think legislators are increasingly sheepish about load, just loading costs into electricity prices, but I'm not sure how much progress we're gonna make. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, I see the virtual applause is happening. Um, so I, I'd like to, applause. yeah, <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, folks to raise their hands and, and ask some questions. All right, John, go ahead. Hi there. Thank you for the Hi. presentation. Um, I was, this might be a little bit past the scope of your work, but, um, you mentioned that these changes you're proposing wouldn't be very popular with the rooftop solar people. So I guess I'm just curious if you think that taking on rooftop solar advocates is a winnable political battle here in California. I, I, winnable is a matter of degree. Um, are we going to get prices down to social marginal cost and move it all onto the state budget? Uh, no, I, I'd be surprised. I hope we will. Um, do we have a chance to change the net metering rules so that they aren't quite so over the top generous and uh, don't keep basically subsidizing at the incredibly high rates? Uh, yeah, I think we do. By the way, let me give you a little history. When we adopted net metering back in the 90s, uh, California rate, the difference between the rate and social marginal cost was much smaller than it is today. What's happened since then is our rates have gone up much faster than inflation and social marginal cost has actually declined partially because of the, uh, the decline in gas prices and partially because the grid's a lot cleaner. So the externalities have gotten smaller. So that gap has gotten immense. So the extra subsidy, and that gap is the subsidy 
from net metering um, and, and from installing solar generally. So that subsidy has gotten massively larger. So even if you argued back 20 years ago that this is an appropriate subsidy, I think it's harder and harder to argue, though certainly people who have their own money on the line will, uh, that this is appropriate now. Um, so I think, well, I think it is a uh, policy uh, worth examining, and I think it is worth recognizing the implications of what we're doing. And I think eventually it will cause some change, but I've been doing this long enough to know that uh, it's not going to overnight uh, move to what I think is a much better policy. Maria. Maria. I'll let you call out. <laughs> okay. Hi, Severin. Uh, thank you for your uh, fantastic presentation. So um, you mentioned income-based fixed charge, and you mentioned three approaches um, to deal with that. I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned it and I missed it, but could you please let me know which of the three you think is the best? Because uh, I was thinking about the presumption of uh, the presumptive fixed charge based on location, and it just seems like, could there be, you know, chance of error maybe there are people who are not who do not fall within that category of uh, income and still live there for some reason yeah i i'm not going to say which i think is the best approach i think they, that really is sort of beyond my skill set it would depend very much on the administrative costs of and the legal barriers to exchanging that sort of information um but i think the idea of having some sort of deemed or presumptive income level is a good one, but it would have to come with an application process that if you think you have your income's been overstated, you can appeal, which is, by the way, how we do um, property tax evaluations now. So there are lots of ways to do this um, and that, that sort of could cut down on the administrative uh process but uh, you know i i think it's going to um it's going to take some real work uh this would be a big lift it would be a big change for the state to go this direction it's not something that we proposed um you know lightly because we recognize that on an administrative and legal side there would be a lot of barriers um i would rather see what I think is a much simpler solution, but politically perhaps much more difficult of moving a lot of these costs onto the state budget. Uh, but if we are going, if we aren't going to do that, I think the income-based fixed charge is very much worth exploring. I, I would guess the Franchise Tax Board would not be thrilled about participating in this. There would be lots of privacy issues and security issues and so forth that would have to be worked out. But I think that's true of every state agency that, you know, when you say we want you to take on this new burden, um, they, they are often not very excited about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kelsey. Hi, uh, thank you. This is definitely an enlightening presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about how um, if the CCAs in California have been kind of included in uh, your work and how um, your opinion on that, if there was more policy in their favor, um, how they could contribute to the cost. Well, I will actually quote one of the CCA directors about this, that they are on the sidelines on this because the costs that we're talking about are not part of the component of the bill that the CCA covers. The CCA just is an energy provider, an electricity, sorry, an energy procurer. They go out and buy electricity on your behalf. All of those transmission and distribution costs are not uh, their domain at all. And even that big box on generation is not, oh, and the public purpose programs are collected also on the distribution side. So that's out of their control. But even the bigger box on generation is mostly out of their control because most of that's historical uh, contracts, which are allocated to the CCAs through a, a regulatory process. So 
while we have gotten a lot of positive feedback from CCAs on this idea, uh, because they would just like to see prices reflect costs so that electrification is easier to do, um, they are not they are not major players in this because they are not the ones who really are responsible for these costs. Thank you. Bruce. Morning, thanks for that really helpful uh, information. Uh, Bruce Chamberlain, the Berkeley Campus Energy Manager. And I was curious if you could speak to a current, I believe it's an SB Senate bill that I'm getting several emails from the solar industry about um is this 1195 it could be it's it's basically couching it as the utilities um squashing solar um, okay so let me say a couple things first of all as you probably figured out i'm not the best friends with um the rooftop solar industry folks um although i have friends who work in that industry and many former <laughs> students actually who work in that industry um uh, there are a lot of people concerned about the extremely high rates and re recognizing that those rates do not reflect the savings that are, are flow from somebody installing rooftop solar and have nothing to do with the utilities. So uh, turn the ratepayer advocacy group, the uh, California, uh, I forget what they're called, PAO, um, the internal CPUC ratepayer advocate group, uh, NRDC, uh, you know, there are lots of groups who recognize that the system right now is not fair and not workable. Um, even some full-throated advocates of energy efficiency who historically have said, you know, we need higher rates to encourage people to conserve have changed their tune on this and have turned around and said, yeah, yeah, if we need electrification, this is, we're going the wrong direction now. The solar industry respond, or the rooftop solar industry responds by saying, um, A, this is the utilities trying to squash rooftop solar, and I am certainly not going to defend the utilities. They have their own perverse incentives and have for years, I think, done things that are incredibly inefficient. Um, uh, but there are a lot of groups <clears throat> who I think that they're tr now trying to say that turn is a tool of the utilities, which <clears throat> if you know their history is sort of a joke. Um, uh, they, they, are, they are historically really advocates against the utilities. Um, and of course, I've been called the tool of the utilities. Um, but I, I think the real question setting aside all the political rhetoric is <clears throat> how much does the system save when a person installs rooftop solar? And that's the right question to debate. And there are people, serious people in the industry who are saying the savings are huge. And then I think they're wrong. I'm willing to have that debate. Um, the most well-known one is a study by Vibrant Clean Energy, which if you're in this space, you've heard about, where they came about saying that on that the system uh, could sa save substantial amounts and that we should, uh, we should have a significant role of rooftop solar. The problem is that when you dig into their study, it is, in my opinion, deeply flawed in a couple of ways. Um, it basically embedded, and you got to read the actual uh, study and the manual of how their simulation works, but embedded in their simulation is an assumption that there are no economies of scale in the distribution system. So that if we reduce the amount of electricity flowing to households by 30%, you save 30% on distribution. And that's just, completely at odds with any grid engineer you talk to. Um, then there's an even deeper flaw that has to do with the way they calculate um, the relationship between uh, how much rates change. They First of all, they assume it's linearly, so this is a proportional, that's the thing I just mentioned. 
But even there are some, the way they calculate it massively over, overstates the savings. Um, so the vibrant study, which I think most of the solar people would say is the most serious study on this, the supporting their view, I think is really deeply flawed. And uh, that, but that's a discussion worth having. The discussion, you know, the utility, everybody who's a, who, who thinks other than we do is a tool of the utilities, I, I think is not worth having. The NRDC is not a tool of the utilities. The TURN is not a tool of the utilities. We are not a tool of the utilities. Uh, you know, I, I, that, that's just sort of throwing mud because you don't have real arguments. I think that was 1195, and I think that bill has died. So you should, you probably didn't get anything in the last few weeks about that. If you did, it's a different bill. Um, oh, okay. I, I did this week. So um, there okay, must be well, a different bill. <laughs> send me an email. I'd be happy to chat with you further. I don't, I don't know if I know. That's fine. One. Appreciate, appreciate it. And the next question comes from a man who needs no introduction since I already introduced him. Um, this is my yeah, longtime co-author, Jim. Jim, is this a question? The uh, yeah. Um, well, I was just going to, a clarification. I think my memory is, is you were just called a tool. Um, and, and I don't remember the, of the utility part, but you know, that's sort of, um, so yeah, my question was a couple kind of variants of your rate design. Um, and, and I wonder if you looked at this. So one would be, uh, the proposal that I know you've discussed, which would be just a care fixed charge and a non-care fixed charge. Um, and you know, what that would look like if, um, if that was sort of what you were restricted to, have you guys sort of calculated how high the non-care fixed charge would have to be if uh, if it was that simple? And and I don't know if you know. I guess you you could start with restricting yourself to the non-care being or the care being two thirds of the non-care, um, but you could sort of play with the percentages as well. But um, with all the flaws associated with knowing who is and and who deserves to be on care. So there are a couple of problems. Um, one, the one you just referenced is, for those of you who aren't aware of this, the CARE program is a completely unenforced, uh, unmonitored program. Um, That's not quite true. There is a 1% audit rate on people on CARE. So every year, 1% of people on CARE get a form saying, you claim to be low income, please fill out this form uh, to show that you are. Uh, it's basically an income verification form. The penalty for not filling it out is either you get kicked off care, but there's no back penalty, or you don't get kicked off care and they just ignore it. Um, that is, in recent years, there's been so much pressure to sign people up that they, for a while, just stop removing people. So I... You know, I, it's such a poorly enforced program that I think if there were a big economic incentive, um, the cheating would be a much bigger problem. I'm actually, when I did a study of this 15 years ago, was heartened to find most of the people on care live in neighborhoods that are truly low income. So I, it was sort of heartening. Since then, the, the share of people on care has gone way up, though, and I haven't done that study again. Um, as far as the levels, the level for non-care would be substantially lower than the fixed charge than the level that we calculate for the highest uh, income quintile. They would have to be just by math, um, mm -hmm. but it would have to be higher than the fixed charge that we calculate for if we had the, a uniform fixed charge, which is about $70 a month. So it would be a significant fixed charge. And there are plenty of people not on care who aren't eligible who are pretty low income. So a family of four earning $54,000 a year in California um, is not care eligible. And adding to their electricity bill by something that I would guess would be about a $50 a month increase would be a pretty big hit. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, I don't the think other it's variant. really a, a solution to mm -hmm. focus on care. That's why I yeah. 
the other variant that you may not have the data for is just what would happen if everybody who has solar was somehow grandfathered. Yeah, that's a good question um, because you're right. The way we have done this is taking everybody off the subsidy and an alternative is you leave them on the subsidy, you leave all the transfer that we show in that graph, but you uh, say nobody else can do it. Um, by the way, the solar industry says, oh, so in other words, you wanna leave the rich people with their solar, but now don't allow the poor people to buy solar too. Uh, the fact is that it's still disproportionately rich people installing solar today. Okay, I think we're supposed to stop, but I'll take Tanner and then I think that's the last one. Uh, Alyssa, is that right? We're past time, but go ahead, Tanner. Appreciate it. Um, you mentioned the kind of collaboration between government departments when it comes to finding income versus, you know, like household, we'll say zip code or for, you know, what level of detail, but has there been any real uh, private enterprise, truly investor driven industries with that level of detail of government information? Do you know of any kind of where that has a basis at? Not in the consumer facing side that I'm aware of. What we do know is that, and unfortunately we know this from bad experiences, is that governments often share very, very confidential information with uh, data management companies who in some cases have then been subject to attacks and leaked the data. Um, and that's part of what gives everybody pause. But, the, but it is done. That is governments often use private companies such as Amazon to store their data. And so they are transferring data with those companies. Um, I think the security issue is less of an issue than the privacy issue. I think that people might really push back on the idea that you're gonna tell PG&E how much I make. Um, and that's why the deemed income approach or the bucket approach might be better than, or a third party intermediary um, might be better than doing it as a uh, through an information transfer of that sort. Uh, 